today, this review that I'm about to give you is really, I'm not going to tell you anything, not one thing that all of you don't already know. What I'm going to do is take you through a tour of what life is like if you were to be with me at the Men's Health Center at the University of Washington, where we just see a high volume of men presenting at all stages uh, of all different etiologies of erectile dysfunction. And much like Dr. Terlicki did a few days ago um, in providing a guide for how he manages genital pain syndromes, uh, this is just to help you see, you know, how do we, how do we navigate these men through this? Um, I, it turns out I don't only see 66-year-old men with hypogonadism. I also see 56-year-old men who have had their prostates removed. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you to just read through this case and these scenarios and then keep in your mind sort of what your approach may be. And I'm going to give you a minute to do that. Okay. So we'll come back to him at the end. <clears throat> And my objective today really is um, to give you a stepwise approach. Um, and I really think that uh, this is more a tour of what the experience that I want my patients to have when they come into the office, which is I need to give them information so that they can get on board with me about what we're going to do. And I think that's really helpful to share with them what the problem is, educate them, let them understand more about the biology of their disease. And by doing so, you're going to help them embrace the various solutions that you have for them. Um, I want to point out that men in general across age categories don't, you know, their community doesn't allow them to share their erectile dysfunction problems, despite us knowing how prevalent it is. And so I think if we can remove some of the stigma of this disease, sort of normalize it for men, give them information about the fact that when they're sitting in the gym locker room, it's highly likely that their peers around them are experiencing the same thing. They're just not sharing it. Uh, and, and that will allow them to share more with you, and then you'll be more effective in how you can treat them. Um, you all know what ED is, but I make sure that I educate my patients on what ED is. And, you know, people, you know, it's easy to get into a defensive posture about, you know, if you feel like somebody's being punitive with you about your own health, your own health choices, your age even. And so I, you know, I let them know, shoot, uh, ED starts in the 20s and I have patients who are in their teens with ED. Um, but yet there are some populations of men that require a little bit more attention and aging is, you know, you can't stop the clock. Aging is a risk factor for ED. And so I, I love this old Massachusetts male aging study diagram that really helps us to understand that if you live long enough, if every man lives long enough, likely he is going to experience loss of erection. And the older he gets, the more profound that loss is going to be. And I think that giving that information to our patients, letting them know that our sexual and reproductive function it was re it was truly intended for reproduction so you know it's okay and it's okay for us to solve it um i think there are some other powerful statistics and the one i like the most because most of my patients who will come in to see me or are referred or find me de novo uh, they've either gotten a hold of some oral therapy uh, either through a physician or through an online service or just from a friend, and it didn't work. And I let them know that's okay too. Turns out you're the norm. At least half, roughly half of men who use oral pills for which the ads would suggest they're amazing, and they are amazing, uh, but they're not going to work for everyone. I think that if we can explain some of the underlying biology, the physiology, and the pathophysiology, the light bulb will go on for men, and it lets us better and more quickly, more quickly explain how we're going to treat it. And we all know that time is limited, so we have to be relatively quick in how we take men through this tour. So I give them information uh, about what erection is. I like to talk about hydraulics. Most individuals have a basic understanding of hydraulics. 
Um, high school educated, a lot of my patients are only high school educated or less. And so if I can, you know, uh, create analogy to where they are in life with hydraulics, it really helps. I talk about the cavernosal arteries as hydraulic lines and the corpora cavernosa as hydraulic cylinders. And then I just talk a little bit about arousal and the notion that putting a pill in your mouth is nothing without some trigger that launches an erection. They need to be aroused. That could be with a visual stimulus. It could be a thought, could be tactile. And then I, I walk them through that response and that's gonna put me in a position to maybe I'm gonna to wanna to prescribe something more to them and now they'll understand why. Men love to tell me uh, about their overall health. And I say, listen, um, that coronary artery disease that you have, that peripheral vascular disease that you have, well, let me tell you about why this is also impacting your erection. Because men won't automatically draw that conclusion. So I love to hold up my finger and say, listen, this is, this is analogous to your carotid artery, the blood vessel that's supplying blood to your brain, the one that when that you know that stroke you had, by the way? That was a blockage of a vessel this big. Now imagine, and I hold up the, the ballpoint pen that I'm writing with, and I say, now imagine how that same disease process has affected this diameter over your life. And you know, suddenly you can see the awareness dawn on them and the willingness to embrace the next step in therapy. These are all risk factors that you know about, but I use this as a way to help elucidate for men what could be going on in their life that could be affecting them. And I don't want to spend too much time on these specific diseases, but certainly anyone who's seeing a lot of ED has a large population of men with diabetes. And I think just taking a moment to say, listen, this is a disease that attacks your nerves, your small blood vessels, your large blood vessels, and they will understand. I, this is old data, but I absolutely love it, which is the, that control arm of the prostate cancer prevention trial that helped us understand that an incident erectile dysfunction event is tantamount to smoking a pack of cigarettes per day or having a, a family history of coronary artery disease. So I take this as a moment to help connect men from their sexual dysfunction to their general health, and I seize on that motivational moment to get them to be more activated and engage in the, the behaviors that I think can help them. And as somebody who works in a tertiary quaternary center with many partners who perform radical prostatectomies, um, I, I let people know, listen, if I needed a prostatectomy, I, I would have my prostate removed by one of my partners. That's how excellent they are. But even the most excellent surgeon, the most perfect surgery performed, you still may not be exactly the same as you were before. And we know that this, this is even true for non-urologic surgeries. I know that my patients that go into erectile dormancy, as I call it, after uh, a, a knee replacement or a gallbladder removal, they too will describe to you how they lost erection afterwards. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that story, but I think it's absolutely true. But... Laying this foundation will then allow me to begin talking about what I think the solutions are. And as somebody who's a specialist in ED, I like to get that all out up front. And I like to uh, let people know that there's a menu, there's a toolbox that I have, and it will ultimately be up to them to choose what is out of the toolbox. But I give them some basic information. And in the olden days when I was a trainee, it was always this iterative, if this fails, then that, if that fails, then the next step. And this is no longer where we are in the modern treatment of erectile dysfunction. Absolutely, we should be embracing the opportunity to enhance the health of our patients. We should be addressing the diabetes that's out of control. We should be addressing people who are smoking, are sedentary, and we should try to motivate them for more. But when it comes to actually administering therapies like pills, penile-specific therapies, or surgery, I think we should be talking about them on the same plane. And, and my patients don't need to fail any of these things before I'm willing to offer them a surgical alternative. And I, and I hope you'll be the same. 
I like to, and I'll go through this portion of the talk quickly, which is to say, I like to have in my mind a few advantages and disadvantages of every line of therapy so that I can walk through it relatively quickly. Um, I, you know, pills are easy. Everyone is used to taking pills, and for those in whom it works, it's a wonderful treatment. Um, but we know that it has just limited effectiveness, and we know, I think, that it just doesn't offer the same spontaneity, perhaps, as some other therapies. I give my patients a little bit of background on what I think side effects of these pills would be, so have this in your back pocket, too, because suddenly having blue vision or your head feel like it's going to pop off or an ache in your back muscles can be really frightening after you take these pills. And so I think letting your patients know what can happen, um, and these are the major things that occur, um, I think can make them feel more comfortable and embrace multiple trials. And I like my patients to try pills multiple times before they give up, especially if that's where they want to remain. These localized therapies, whether it's topical or intraurethral alprostadil, you know, I, for some men, this is one step above a pill, but these are not stellar therapies. They're historically very expensive. We now work with a compounding pharmacy that does a topical alprostadil. Does it work very well? Not really. So I let my patients know that the effectiveness is limited. Um, but if, they, if they're just not ready to move on, this could be a choice for them. And I tell my patients, listen, you know, if we really want to take the next step up in therapy, let's consider an, a, a, an injectable therapy where we can deliver a Viagra-like medicine directly into the compartment where it needs to work without systemic side effects. Um, but again, I think the greatest challenge with these therapies is spontaneity, you know, the true enjoyment of sexual activity or intimacy. Uh, and you know, that's what it's really all about. Not only do these therapies actually have to be real world effective, but let's be honest, our patients need to enjoy them and they can't dread, they cannot dread every time they want to be intimate. Um, even for my newest patients and my youngest patients, I do discuss the role of prosthetics. Um, I let them know that for me, the advantages of prosthetics one, two, and three are spontaneity, spontaneity, and spontaneity. It's the one tool that I have in my toolbox that will allow somebody to have an erection at their fingertips. And from the moment they decide they want to be intimate, they can go from flaccid to erect within 30 to 45 seconds. Um, it is true. The disadvantage is it requires surgery and recovery. But in experienced hands, this is a relatively uncomplicated procedure. I wanted to talk just briefly about, you know, uh, alternatives to the inflatable prosthesis, which I now have introduced into my practice much later than, uh, than you might have expected. But I used to be so dogmatic about how I wouldn't use a non-inflatable device. And a few years back, I became a participant in a national trial to look at outcomes of this Boston Scientific product, and it opened my eyes. It opened my eyes to a cadre of men that I was seeing who I thought were just not fit for surgery um, who, or who were too afraid of an anesthetic or for any reason weren't going to make it to an OR easily. And what I realized is that this is a procedure that I could almost do in the office under a local anesthetic and that my patients were quite happy, those who elected this. So have an open mind, and we know from a lot of worldwide data that this can be a very satisfying alternative. So keep it, keep it in your toolbox. I think vacuums can work. They absolutely work, and they are a great form of penile physical therapy in my mind. But I usually describe it as such, penile physical therapy. Um, and usually not a great long-term strategy to maintaining intimacy. And I want to point out, you'll hear me use the phrase intimacy a lot, and I've found that that's a really comfortable term that I can use with my patients, and when their partners are present, that helps destigmatize discussion about sexual restoration. I'm, gonna, I'd like, I'm hoping that during our critique panel, we're going to engage more in discussion of these therapies. Um, but... To, to just quickly say my brief take on particularly low intensity shockwave therapy. Um, you know, for me, this is not a therapy that I offer 
Uh, I think you all know it remains investigational and does, is not a Medicare billable. But I think data is slowly emerging, and I think we'll see more data emerge from randomized controlled trials that would suggest that if you have a patient who is responsive to oral medications but just misses the spontaneity of not taking a pill, that may be, that may be the patient who we learn is capable of getting a good response from a temporary response from low intensity shockwaves. But I want to be clear, and we'll get, maybe we can talk more about this in detail, and, and others who are present can share their experience. Not all shockwaves are the same, and some are just tantamount to ultrasound. In fact, probably the majority of what's being offered is not true low intensity shockwave. And there simply is no data to support the injection of fresh frozen plasma into the, in, or, or, or sorry, of, uh, of plasma into the into the penis for restoration. So these are things that I, I personally do not offer. So back to our, our patient, our 56-year-old who's just not responding well after his radical prostatectomy. Um, I think, you know, for me, I think it's absolutely importantly that we review sort of fitness with that individual and the role of just maintaining good muscle mass and cardiovascular fitness. I think it's really critically important that we educate these patients, and I think education, even in a time-limited environment, can happen pretty quickly. Um, and I think, you know, know your toolbox. You know, if you're a prosthetic urologist and you're comfortable, uh, then don't be afraid to offer even your younger patients or those who haven't failed every step of therapy prosthetic therapy. It's, it's a phenomenal way to restore somebody's erectile function. But if it's not in your toolbox, know who you like to refer to, who can discuss that potential as well. And I think the verdict is still out on whether or not he should be referred for any low intensity shockwave therapy. But for a patient who's after radical prostatectomy, we know has this clearly defined risk factor for ED, this probably is never going to be the therapy for him. So these are my take home messages. I, I like every patient who leaves my office to leave with hope. Um, you know, they feel generally a sense of loss. They're saddened by this. So I just let them know, listen, there's a ton of diseases that we can't cure, but yours, man, we got this. Um, I, I take the opportunity to not neglect their general health. Um, and I take that opportunity to seize the motivational moment. Uh, to get them to, to take charge of some bad habit or to take on better habits. And then when, when I'm out of my comfort zone with any other disease, whether it's a stone or BPH or a high PSA, I push that patient on, and I think ED is the same way. And I think my partners agree with that as well. Uh, so it, I just want to say uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here. You, uh, everyone here has been a phenomenal audience. I've gotten great questions. The interaction has been wonderful. And I've just loved getting to know my colleagues better. So thanks, everyone, and I hope you have an awesome day.